Well, welcome to another edition of AP's Profiles in Christian Living. I have a very special guest with me today, Mr. Martin Isles, who's the Managing Director of the Australian Christian Lobby. I've been waiting a long time for this interview, so welcome, Martin. It's great to have you with us. It's good to be here, Mark. Now, Martin, I've got to ask you this straight up. There's a lot of people, uh, particularly in the Christian church, that would be hesitant, let's say, about the work of ACL because they say we should only only be talking about Jesus. Um, That's the the church's main mission. Mm. Um, what would you say in response to that? Well, I would probably respond with some of the words of Jesus himself, um, and that would be uh, that people may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Mm. And he's there talking about our role in the world as those who are not compromised by the world as salt and those who are visibly seen uh, for what we are, mm. which is followers of Christ, which is Christians uh, with all of the, uh, the all that goes along with that, uh, you know, in the world, that's that's our job. Um, and when people say, "Oh, you know, um, I think we're just supposed to talk about Jesus," uh, I sit there and go, "Well, how often do you talk about Jesus, really? <laughs> you know, yeah. are you going into your local takeaway and talking about Jesus, and then you're going down on the train and striking up conversations about Jesus?" There's the odd person that does that, but the vast majority of people aren't doing that. You've got a whole life to live. You've got interactions with work, with culture, with society, with government, with institu- everything. And we need to be whole Christians. Mm. We need to be those who, through every facet of our lives and living, and through all that we speak and say, and all that we do at cost in the world for the sake of truth and righteousness and Christ himself, points people back to who we really are. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I have always intended through what I do to make it very, very clear that the reason we believe these things, the reason we do these things is ultimately because we have an organising principle behind it all, which is that we are followers of Christ, which Mm. is that we are those uh, who know the truth Mm. and where is the truth to be found. So those who follow us should be able to ask those deeper questions. Mm. And I think that's the same with every Christian life. They should be able to watch you and ask those deeper questions. Mm. Uh, And we sometimes get upset by the fact that when we do this, people get upset with us and so we think we're not doing a good job. Complete garbage. Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, right? Yep. He wouldn't have said that if it wasn't going to happen. Mm. And so you're going to get both. You're going to get the persecution for righteousness' sake and the next breath, which is people who see your good works and glorify your Father. Mm. We need to be whole Christians, not just those who limit our role to talking about Jesus, whatever that really means. You know, We're supposed to live it and we're supposed to point people, yes, back to the, the foundations of the gospel. See, that's really interesting because one of the things I've noticed, particularly with you uh, in your leadership of ACL, is you talk about Jesus a lot. Uh, and when it comes yeah. to any Good. issue, <laughs> whether, it. whether it's about yeah. motherhood or anything, you bring sure. it back to the Bible. Yeah. Um, am I right in observing a change from, say, more common grace arguments that ACL might have used in the past to more overtly explicit Biblical references. Is that is that something that you feel like is an emphasis in your own leadership? Definitely, right from the start, yeah. So um, I, I did. I remember telling my board when I was offered the role, I said, you know, the way I think and speak by default tends to be sort of biblical categories. Yeah. Uh, and that tends to be my foundation stone, and I, I go back there a lot, and I'm quite overt about it because I, I don't – that's just how, I'm, how I, I think. Uh, and I said, just so you know, FYI. Uh, and they were fine with that. They said, oh, absolutely, mm. um, that, that sounds good. You know, you go for it. Uh, and so I started to speak more and more overtly about, yeah, the fundamentals. Because, you know, again, this is just what, what, what Scripture and what Jesus himself said. He says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Uh, yeah. Or he tells us that we are salt and light, but to what end? So people would give glory to God. Um, the point is, I'm not interested in good for goodness sake. Mm. I'm not interested in it just for the sake of good. And there's a big lie that went around for some decades, I think, that Christians should, when they walk into the public sphere, wear a secular hat. Uh, And I was advised by many political types at the time that you need to come in with secular reason and arguments. And I'm sitting there going, why? Like, what are we here for? Mm. You cannot escape the fact that at the end of the day, we are here so that the gospel goes to all nations, all people, and we make disciples. Uh, And so I'm sitting here going, well, ACL and the ministry we do is another testimony of the transforming power of the gospel and the truth of God as we find it in Scripture as revealed for all people. Um, And that's the goal. 
Mm. Okay, let me drill down on a specific topic, which is in the news at the moment. Uh, the Victorian legislation on gay conversion, or the ban on gay conversion therapy. Yep. Uh, it's just got passed through the Victorian um, Parliament without amendment. Mm-hmm. They've already started in New South Wales, a, a group of um, cross-party politicians have said that they will push for the same legislation. Why is trans... How big a threat do you think the transgender movement is? Well, fun, look, it's, it's huge on several fronts. So, first of all, transgenderism attacks a timeless creation truth which is that in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Mm. And then you read through and God can, gives his purposes for man and woman. Yep. You know, woman is called mother and helper from the beginning, man is called worker and keeper from the beginning, they're to be fruitful, they're to multiply, they're to have joint authority, etc. Yep. Uh, transgenderism attacks that truth right at the very core, which is what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a person as designed by God. Mm. So it's an attack on creation. Now, Romans 1 teaches us that an attack on creation is an attack on the creator. It's, a, it's an anti-God idea. Uh, and so that's why we need to take it extremely seriously and make the deduction that the implications of this, the consequences of this are going to be grave. They're going to be terrible. They're going to be serious. It's going to be a crisis and a disaster. Mm-hmm. And that's what we see. And the more I see, the more I read, the more stories I encounter, the more people I speak to who have come from that kind of background, the more I realise uh, that this is among the great humanitarian crises of our day. Uh, And it's going on in our midst, it's going on right in front of us, and it's got a veneer of respectability and medicine and all this about it. Uh, And we sit back and, you know, so often we spend our time engaging with this, trying to be, you know, so kindly and nuanced that we say nothing. Mm. Uh, But actually this is a very wicked thing and it's destroying lives in huge numbers. You see referrals to youth gender clinics from minors going up by 1,000, 1,500, 2,000% in, in a small space of years. Mm. You see like the Tavistock case in the UK that came up at the, the yeah. uh, they found out that the Tavistock clinic, like other clinics, basically never turns a young person away. They just affirm them in their transgender identity from the start. And they've got 10-year-olds having to answer questions about whether they want children in the future, mm. things like this. Kids who can't even choose their own bedtime because they're kids. Uh, And meanwhile, they can go down this path. And the harrowing stories I have read, they're frightening, they're horrendous, they're awful. The destruction that this wreaks on a life uh, is pretty much permanent. These people, you know, they'll spend the rest of their life getting over it. Uh, It's a great humanitarian crisis of our time. And what's happened in Victoria, you mentioned the change in suppression bill, is effectively they know that this truth is so fragile because it's contrary to creation itself. It's so obvious that we're male and female. It's so obvious that that's the principle upon which humanity works, that Mm. there's men and women and they, you know, marry and have kids and families. It's just the biological design. Mm. The truth is so... this, This lie is so fragile because the truth is so obvious that they're using more and more powerful means to shut down the truth about the issue. That's why social media will... You know, the surest way to get censored on social media is to talk about this. Yeah. You know, the big companies will ban your stuff, they'll delete you, they'll know... Even if it's you. in the subject line straight away, it just gets oh, shadow banned. Absolutely. They shadow ban, they have algorithms that run over it, all sorts of stuff. And mm-hmm. we've seen this in what we do and many others have seen it as well. Um, but also now they, you know, the vilification laws came along, like in Tasmania, they said if you uh, mispronoun someone, basically then you are offending them on the basis of their gender expression, that's unlawful. But now in Victoria, you've got a situation where basically you know the truth, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, it seems to me the most insidious aspect of this is um, the redefinition of what even is domestic violence. So now it's mm. it's really is a, it, an attack upon the nuclear family, isn't it? So if it, it's driving a wedge between parental authority and rights over their own children. Um, that that that's got to uh, be massive concern because they're not going to come for the pastor. They're going to come for the pe- the Christian parent first, aren't they? Well, I think what's going to happen is, I mean, you're talking about the fact that there is actually a provision in the bill that says that uh, that, that opens the door for a parent affirming their child in their biological sex mm. rather than saying, yes, Johnny, wear the dress and be a girl. Yeah. Uh, opening the door for them to be a domestic violence yeah. abuser. Yeah. Um, which is true. That's exactly what's in the bill. Um I think the way this will play out is, you know, some people think, well, okay, tomorrow a pastor's going to be taken to court. 
that's not the way it's going to go. No. Uh, and you can think, for example, when vilification laws were changed to say you can't offend people on the basis of their chosen identity. It took some years before the cases started to ramp up. I think it'll be a bit less than that because things are moving faster. But initially what you're going to see is the Equal Opportunity Commission in Victoria really weaponised with this huge range of new powers. And one of the things they said they're going to do is go and give information packages to churches to tell them what they can and can't say and how they can be nice and PC around these issues. They're going to start doing those sorts of things, re-educating, training and launching investigations. They have nearly limitless powers to investigate. They could come to an organisation like mine and say, give us all these emails, give us all these documents, we're checking you out, we're auditing you. That's the sort of thing that's going to start to happen. Give it time and some activists will, with some financial backing from a government-funded you know, LGBTQ lobby group is going to go and launch an actual case against somebody. But what we need to be prepared for is that usually that case is well chosen. Usually it's against someone who for some reason is a bit hard to defend. It may well be a parent who's been a little bit unwise, but nonetheless the principle that they're, that they're, that they're invoking is something that needs to be opposed. And that's where we're going to find ourselves, in that crisis of saying, oh, well, this person wasn't very winsome, or maybe this person... Or nuanced. Or, or any of these things, right? Mm. Or maybe if I, was the, if I was a parent, I wouldn't have done it. I mean, this is what we're great mm. at, right? Mm. As if when our day in the sun comes, it's going to be perfect and we're going to be blameless. Yeah. But, you know, if I was a parent, I wouldn't have done what that parent did. Yeah. And therefore, whoever comes to the rescue to save them is going to be made into yeah. a little bit of a problem. That's a very good point. And that's what's going to happen. Okay, so ACL, you really have a privileged position in that you get around the whole country, you see the state of the church and the churches and their leadership, or maybe that should be lack thereof. Um, because I want to ask you a question on how do you think Christian leaders and pastors, denominational leaders as well, should respond? The Presbyterian Church of Australia, for instance, Reverend Dr. Peter Barnes, Moderator General at the moment, has um, issued a, a statement um, just in the last 24 hours the, uh, reminding all ministers of their obligation with their ordination vows to preach the whole counsel of God mm -hmm. and with Daniel 6, as when da Darius made the decree mm -hmm. not to pray, to defy that um, mm -hmm. government instruction. Mm -hmm. Do you agree or what do you think should be done? I agree. Um so I think the important thing is, this is a question we've got to answer, actually, mm. because in recent years, some things that we want to do have become harder to do. So, for example, uh, Christian schools have been put in a more and more difficult position, yeah. especially in some states and territories, to uphold their ethos. And they're always dancing around saying, gosh, how can we walk the tightrope of what's legal and what's right? Okay, that's been getting harder over time. Lots of Christians are saying, well, can I say this on social media now? Can I do this? Is this even lawful? So we need to answer the question, well, what should we do when there's bad laws? What should we do when the law seems to stop us from doing something we ought to do? And I think that this example is a very clear one because it actually comes up against, as I said, what it's doing is it's, it's, it's attacking creation. It's making certain practices that are, that are mandatory, like prayer, like teaching the whole counsel of God like being a godly parent, teaching your children in the ways of righteousness, yeah. the way they should go, all this kind of stuff, or as a medical professional, what you know to be true and right for a person. You know, these are mandatory as Christians. We can't check out of these. And yet the government's come along and said, no, nah, stop. Now that invokes for me the Acts chapter 5 exemption, which is when, when the apostles go to the Sanhedrin, which I call the ancient anti-discrimination tribunal, and they go in there and go, do you need to stop saying these naughty things? You know, you need to moderate your words. Uh, and which the is, response is? We must obey God rather than yeah. men. Because they had the instructions of Christ, go and preach, yeah. right? And they knew they could not follow that rule. Mm -hmm. This is a case of that. We cannot follow this rule. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that people should go out there and, uh, you know, uh, engage in the abusive and coercive kinds of practices that they that the government claimed that bill was to prevent. Of course, we don't do that. We don't believe in those things. Those things are not happening in Victoria. They're, they're old-fashioned. It's not a thing. So, you know, don't do that. But if somebody comes to you and says, pray for me, pray for them. If you come up to Romans 1 or Ephesians 5 and you're teaching or you're doing a Bible study or you're going through with your family, go through it. And do not moderate what because you Because here's the other thing I think a lot of people miss. Under this legislation that has just been passed, even if someone gives you their consent yeah. and asks you to pray yeah. for them, 
You Please can help me. still be prosecuted. That's right. Please help me. They want you to say, no, no, I won't. You know, or um, one of the things I've often done is that, um, <laughs> here I am, confessing to a crime. Uh, one of the things I have done in the past is that people have gotten in touch with issues of transgender regret um, or um, people who experience, say, same-sex attraction but who want to be Christians and who say, look, I want to live apart from that. I want to be a Christian and I want to, you know, live a different life. Uh, and what what's often said to them in those moments mm-hmm. is, well, um, actually, I've got a friend who's been down that road. Mm-hmm. Or here's a here's a guy who, who you should talk to. Uh, here's somebody who helps you out or, or is part of some ministry or something. Uh, and you, you do referral to somebody else. Now, that's also potentially a criminal act. So you can't respond and you can't point them to someone who will respond. Um, that's the, the difficulty here. And, of course, if somebody comes to me and says, pray for me, I am going to pray for them. Mm. You know, it's wrong to say no. Mm. Or if they say, you know, I want to serve Christ, I want to live for the Lord Jesus first, um, can you point me in some direction to someone to talk to? And I say, yeah, actually, here's a phone number, here's somebody, or down the street or whatever, or go to this church, talk to such and such, I will continue to do that because it has to be done. So if I can... Backtrack a little bit in time to just a few years ago when marriage was redefined between no longer a man and a woman. One of the things that um, conservatives politically but also Christians who hold to the Bible said is this will open the door. It will be a Pandora's box or, dare I say, a slippery slope. Is Was that fear unwarranted? Of course not. No, I mean, see, this is one of the things that I think we really lack sometimes, which is discernment about where a thing is actually going. Mm. You know, if you can discern what is the driving impulse behind a cultural change, you, you can discern where it's... where it's. People tell me I say discern wrong. Discern where <laughs> it's actually going to go. Uh, and that's, um, that's so crucial to be able to do. Uh, you need to understand what is making people tick, especially at the activist edge of these sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, and sort of redefinition of marriage was never an end game. Never. That was just you know um, that was just um, uh, that was just getting rid of a bulwark against further cultural change. It was about power culturally. It was about power because one, not exactly. about love, really, because you could always no, no. be with who you wanted to be. Uh, correct. People could live and love as they chose. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, that, w- w- th- there's no crime in homosexuality these days. There's no, you know, society was very is very accepting of all of those whatever people want to do. Uh, it really wasn't the issue. It's political. It's power. Um, and what you see here is a political agenda that is driven to – it's the will to power. It's driven to uh, achieve sufficient cultural and political power to define things as they want to define them, which includes marriage, which includes family, which includes gender. Which is fascinating because this is what Nietzsche himself saw. When you take God out of the equation – um, there's only will to power left, isn't Correct, there? Correct, yeah. Truth or power. I always say truth has stumbled in the streets and only power remains because that's all you're left with. If you don't have a, something to serve, which is truth, you know, the truth of God, if you don't have something objective outside of yourself that you truly believe in that is immovable, all you're left with is, well, let's have a narrative and we need to co-opt the power to enforce that narrative. Okay, so let's go to the truth thing. One of the um, uh, Because one of the really... Exciting initiatives I think I've seen from ACL in the last couple of years is their GPS program. Oh, yeah. Do you want to explain what that's about and uh, what sort of interest people have in that? Yeah, this is Who's one it the, for? Yeah, this is one of the real bright spots uh, in, in ACL's work. Um, it's called GPS. We may change the name, which will make it all very confusing, but it's called GPS at the moment. Which stands for? Just Global Positioning System. <laughs> it's not, it's, not, it's okay. like calling a compass or something. You know, right. it's, it's nothing, <laughs> there's, nothing, <laughs> there's nothing particularly profound about it at all. But it is for 18 to 25-year-olds, although we do get sometimes 17 to 27 or 28. We do, we do get that spectrum occasionally, mm-hmm. but primarily for 18 to 25-year-olds. And it is a, a week-long, effectively worldview boot camp Mm. and people who are at university or going into university or the workplace and at that stage of their life and who are christians you know they've got lots and lots of questions and a lot of questions frankly that they're not getting answered from their church communities uh or and 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 that relate to basically the application of their faith to the real world Mm. uh and so they come along and it's uh it's growing and growing and growing i mean we've had well over 100 but for covid at the last one and this is 18 to 25 year olds 18 to 25 year olds so they're hungry for this oh my goodness they're hungry it's Mm. it's actually um 
It was interesting at the last program we just had, which was fantastic, the energy and the enthusiasm, it was almost ecstatic by the end of the week because oh. they were very keen when they got there. But the more they heard, the more clarity they received, the more they started to understand the things that were really plaguing them and on their mind from people who really understood their brief and understood the culture mm. and understood scripture, the more excited they got. So give me an idea for the... I- I've met some of the lecturers, like mm-hmm. Dr. Stephen Chavera. Yes. Uh, who else have you got that's lecturing there? So the three main people on the last program were myself and Dr. Stephen Chavera and Professor Frank Stutman. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Frank Stutman is a, is a scientist. I don't know whether he's an astrophysicist or something to that, somewhere in that realm. <laughs> and, uh, but he's a yeah, professor and uh, he understands the whole science stuff. He does all the science talks. Then Stephen does uh, the history philosophy talks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do the Biblical Foundations talks. Mm. Uh, now then there are a range of other visitors that come in, so people who do one or two or three talks at mm. a time, uh, and they come from various parts of the church world and the academic world, and they're all they're handpicked. Like they're, they're a really, really solid crew, really worthwhile. Now, your, your name is Martin Isles, right? But you're yes. named after Martin Lloyd-Jones. Yes. Um, that, to me, is an interesting parallel because right. one of the most famous preachers of the 20th century... Um, well known for his biblical exposition, but never went to Bible college, never went to seminary. Right. You're similar, and yet my wife often says to me when she hears you talk, he could be standing up in any pulpit and that would have been an excellent sermon. What has influenced you the most? Yeah, it is an interesting parallel when you put it like that. Um, I've, I guess I've been fortunate in God's grace um, that I have spent a huge portion of my life um, seriously studying scripture and theology. So, no, I haven't been to theological college, but I, I, I just about have, in a sense. Uh, and the, a couple of reasons for that is I just happened to be um, grow up in a church environment where um, it was a participatory environment. You know, you didn't go along and warm the seat and listen. Uh, everyone participated. And so I was expected to be on my feet and participating in worship, in prayer, in facilitating and and even preaching, even as young as, say, 16 years old. Uh, And then, you know, because it was all lay ministry, you know, we decided to start a youth group. uh, And of course, that was up to us. So we did. We all got out there in the community and put up signs and all this and ran events and stuff and ended Mm. up with a a crew of young people from non-church backgrounds. Mm. Um, And it just fell to me providentially to be the leader of that group. Mm. Um, And uh, I ended up teaching every verse of the New Testament to a group of young people over the course of six years. Um, and you know, still stay in touch with some of those today. Mm. Uh, And that was just an incredible thing. And for me to be forced to seriously study and understand every verse of the New Testament, to find good biblical exposition, good theology, learn it, study it, not just to read the book, but to get it in here so that it comes out here. So that's interesting because you've been influenced a lot, I know, um, by sermons online. Yes, uh, yeah. And that that seems to be a generational shift because my generation, we read books. You, yes. your, you read still. I know that, but you force myself to read. But you, you would watch some. You've oh, watched yeah, a lot sooner. more than I have, yep. and not only that, but you've produced excellent content. Like I'm, I'm just looking at the amount of people and views that you ACL receives on Facebook, and the quality of the content is staggering. Well, there's something to be said for this, and this is uh, I flog most of my quotes, by the way, and this one comes from Dr. Jordan Peterson. Uh, he, he made the point that there's been a revolution that's taken place lately, which is on the level of the printing press, but the revolution is not in the written word, it's in the spoken word. Yeah. And the spoken word is now more powerful than the written word, mm. uh, and that is a generational shift. I still write stuff, but it's older supporters that read it but I film stuff and record stuff. And actually all ages will listen and watch, but especially younger people are far more likely to podcast or watch on YouTube. Uh, and that's that's the way I grew up as well. That's my natural inclination. I, I'd sooner listen to anything. Like Martin Lloyd-Jones has written a lot of books and people will say, oh, you read all these books. Actually, I've listened to all his sermons. I've read some of his books, but I've listened to all of his sermons. Uh, and when I was so can I just, just tap onto that? Like mm. if you sold a book, Martin Lloyd-Jones sold a book and it sold 20,000 copies, we'd think that was phenomenal. Yeah. It's a marketing yeah. success. Yeah. Can I ask a personal question? And uh, forgive me if this is inappropriate, <laughs> right? We can always cut it out. 
<laughs> we, we, yeah, we could. I'm worried about where this is going. But well, yeah. no. Yeah. What sort of numbers would ACL oh, yeah. be receiving on Facebook per month? Well, so I've got a Facebook page. ACL has a Facebook page. We've both got Instagram pages, both got YouTube channels, you know, yeah. so there's, there's a fair amount. But one number I do know from this morning, just on my Facebook page, mm. the reach in the last 28 days is 11.5 million. Um, and, uh, so 20,000, 11.5 million. Well, That's yeah. staggering um, numbers. I mean, the overall, I think the number of people who watched a Truth of It episode um, the last six months is something like 25 million people. Um, some of those clips get view counts, and these when it's, when it's a, a view count is not a full view in this context. Yeah. Uh, so it could be a one minute view, but nonetheless, yeah. a lot of them watch through. But a view count of, I think one of them has got about six million on it. Uh, another one would have uh, three odd million. Um, but there's a lot, hundreds of thousands is is the norm. Mm. Now, I mean, these sorts of reach figures and these sorts of numbers. Uh, yeah, they're massive, um, and uh, and and I see. I mean, Billy Graham would be would be wrapped with that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, he got only got a couple hundred thousand when he was when in Sydney. <laughs> yeah, well, I hadn't thought of it that way, <laughs> but yeah, okay, um, they're big numbers, and 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 the reality is, um, it gets out there. You know, uh, if I wander around the streets by myself in Sydney or Melbourne mm. or Brisbane or a country town. It's pretty normal for someone to come up and say g'day uh, or to mention, you know, and that's just to show that the word gets out. People are hearing and and also around the world. We're starting to get a bit of an audience in certain key areas of the world as well. I mean, I must say one of the things that I think impresses me about uh, you and what you're doing is it's not the numbers for you that are driving you though. Oh, sure. It yeah. is like your segment, your own segment. Well, the numbers but, are a complete accident. Well, <laughs> it was, it's a byproduct. It's right? a byproduct. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. But um, yeah. it's the truth of it. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you, I, I'd i often say, wow, that, I want, you know, you, you'll say at the start of a, a, an episode, I'm going to cover vaccines. And I thought, oh, he's going to go there. And you go there. The whole way. And I think <laughs> you are really are concerned about the truth of it. But I I think how he – so here's my question though. Right. How do you maintain your joy? Because I, I've had the pleasure of meeting you a number of times and you've got to be one of the most joyful Christians I know. Oh, and yet you're in the thick of it as well. Yeah, that's true. And I'm sure you get opposition – Oh yeah, of and course. Is it? Is yeah, it? Yeah. I remember I was told when I was at Moore College, um, the Bishop of North Sydney, Paul Barnett. Mm. He said to us one day he was lecturing on one Peter, mm. and he said, "Gentlemen, you will be persecuted far more by those within the church than those outside. At least that has been my experience." Okay. Yep. Is that true? Ooh, I don't know if I could say. Do you get more, more or opposition? Or I don't know if I could say more or less. I'd say from that friendly fire. There is friendly fire and there is hostile fire, and I'm fine with the hostile fire. It just mm. does not bother me in the least because I think, oh well, what do you expect? Mm. You know, if you know your Bible, you know what to expect, right? Mm. And I expect plenty of hostile fire. Mm. Uh, the friendly fire, um, it does vex me a little more, uh, and I've got to just not let it vex me. Uh, but there are there are people. Look, it's true. There are people who are just there to bring you down, there to sow discord, there to make trouble. Uh, and I just believe they're sent for that purpose. Frankly, to to be to be those that tear you down, those that you know. Jesus talks about pearls before swine. There's always going to be those that, no matter what you say, no matter how you say it, basically their mo is to tear you apart, to cause trouble, to be a source of. You know, now that's restless. not a trite thing that you've just said. That's good reformed theology because what you're saying is the devil, as Martin Luther said, is God. I couldn't confirm or deny if it's reformed, Mark. But well, it's good theology. It's, it's, <laughs> this is reformers' bookshop, so I, <laughs> that's true. Partly it is, we it is, we yeah. we are saying that, yeah. but um, but it is good biblical theology because as Martin Luther used to say, the devil is God's devil. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like it's a yin and a yang with good and versus evil. What you're okay. saying is that even evil is in the sovereign hand of God, yes? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I mean, you only need to think of someone like Joseph who said what you meant for evil, God meant for good, which is an incredible statement when you really think about it, mm -hmm. which is that God knew that they were doing something for evil, but it didn't matter in the long run because he had it in his control mm -hmm. uh, and he had it sorted and he would bring about good. And that's the great miracle of the sovereignty of god to mm. me which is that bad will come but it's on god's watch mm. you know he knows and his purposes will be done anyway 
And there's a couple of verses that really encourage me. One, and he bring, God brings all things, good, evil, principalities, powers, natural things, spiritual things, everything, into submission to two concepts according to Scripture, which is the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1. So all things work together according to the counsel of his will. Mm. And secondly, Romans 8, 28, according to the good of all those who love Christ and according, mm. according to his purpose. Uh, those are incredible promises. And that's the great mystery of the sovereignty of God. So even mm. in evil days, uh, that's, do not fear. You know, God is in control. And uh, I feel sometimes like we live in days a little bit like Habakkuk, where Habakkuk says, why am I seeing injustice? Why mm. is God silent? Why is this happening? And God says, I'm doing a work in your day that you wouldn't believe even if I told you. Yeah. Uh, and it was, a, it was quite a terrifying work that he was actually doing at that time. It's one of judgment. I, I don't discount that from the West today. Maybe the, There's a lot of people out there who say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know, That's mm. the condemnation of the false prophets in Jeremiah, that you've healed the wound of my people lightly. You've come along and said, all will be well. And I think mm. of you know, all this, Trump's going to remain president. I think of all this, you know, the West is going to have sunlit uplands, a revival. I think of all this. You know, it might might just be garbage it might just be peace peace when there is no peace uh, one of the marks of the true prophet is that they come along and they give the people what they don't want to hear which is usually judgment and i sit here and i look at the world and i go more likely in my view i don't call myself a prophet so but more likely looking at biblical history the way god's worked where we are today he may well just give the west what we want and if as a judgment. Us, as a judgment, exactly. Mm. And I see us going down that path, which actually amplifies the role of the Christian in that society all the more. Uh, we have such a calling to stand out as the lights in darker, darker, darker places. Mm. Um, and it's not a cause for fear. God is in control. Yeah. God will only let it go so far mm. before he stops it. Now, as I said before, look, I think, I, personally, you're one of the most courageous Christians I know. Um, not only do you speak biblical truth, but you'll tackle things hot potatoes, like cultural Marxism. And I yep. remember that there was a post you put up, Black Lives Matter, in cultural Marxism, and questioning Black Lives Matter even. Mm. And uh, those were interesting days. Those posts. I bet they were. <laughs> they really were. Uh, I mean, as you, I mean, I think history has shown you were on the right side of history. Well, sure. you were on the right side of truth because history has yeah, shown yeah. that. It was just nothing. It's all but come to light. It's right? Marxism. Yeah, right? Absolutely. They've come out and said so. But, yeah. you know, one of the things I must say, my wife is so appreciated about you, and I, and I know she's not alone, is how you have defended the role of the Christian mother. Okay. What, what has I'm been, a very unlikely defender of the well, role you're of the Christian mother, aren't you're, I? <laughs> you're, well, you're not married, but obviously you've come <laughs> yeah, from a, okay. a family. Yeah. Yeah. What, tell us a little bit about how your own family and upbringing has shaped you as a Christian. Oh, profoundly. I mean, it's it's been it's been so much. Um, uh, I mean, I I deal with what are the presenting issues of our time, and nearly invariably they are the controversial issues. They are controversial because they are the presenting issues. They're the contested issues, and they're the issues that people are becoming uh, are becoming more and more aware of. And so I'll speak into them because I want to give. And if I don't know the answer, I won't. You know, there's certain aspects of the vaccine debate, for example, which I haven't touched because I don't know. And I don't know everything. I'm a mortal. But there are things that I do know from God's word. And one of the things that's really contested and under challenge right now is male and female. In the image of God, he made them male and female. He created them. And the truth that God has laid down about what a man is and what a woman is, there are answers to that question in God's purpose and design. And they're not given to us once or twice in broken Greek or Hebrew. It's a narrative from start to finish of Scripture. And I find when I talk about these things with young people, they, they go ecstatic with excitement to hear it mm. because they are so desperate to know. They don't even know what... Can you imagine a young man doesn't even know what a man is? Mm. I mean, it actually makes you... It fills you with grief. And I get so annoyed that I can talk to young people and they drink it in because they know it's basically true and they know how badly they need it and how their generation needs it because they see men that are failing and they see women who are not being women and it, it troubles them. And someone comes along and says, well, here's the blueprint. They go, you know, that makes so much sense. Mm. But if I say that to older crowds, there'll always be some people in the older crowd that get very angry with me. Uh, and it, it bugs me a little bit. And so I think, you know, you, the young people, if, if only the young people are listening, I'm going to keep saying it because it's so important. But here's the thing. You mentioned my own family. Mm. I have seen a Christian family work. And I think that's a great blessing. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, I was just in Adelaide the other day uh, yeah. and talking to a ministry down there that's involved in uh, getting women out of prostitution, for example. 
uh, and how that a lot of them become radical feminists who hate men. And I think, well, I'm not surprised. Mm. That's their experience. Because men have treated them so badly. Men poorly. have treated them so badly. Uh, and, of course, I, I would hate men too <laughs> if that was me. I get it. You know, it's the experience that's seared into them. And because they've seen bad and evil, it, it bends them out of shape. And, it's, yeah. you know, you know, it's not their fault in a way. Um, and a lot of people haven't seen a Christian marriage. They haven't seen a Christian family. They haven't seen it work because family is in such a diabolically parlous state. Uh, I have, and I know the wisdom of God's ways on these issues. And so uh, that's why I feel passionate about talking about it sometimes. And when it comes up, I will, I will address it because I go, you know what, I actually do know something about this. Uh, and I'm here to say, you know, I had a, a godly Christian parents uh, who were a husband and a wife as God had called them to be uh, and who ran a family according to the standards, you know, to the best of their ability that God had laid down. And I sit there and I go, yeah, there's five of us kids uh, every single one of us is a very, very strong, committed, practicing Christian. Uh, all of them are successful individuals with their own families that are intact and functioning. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, and so I've seen this in practice, and so I'm very happy to talk about it. But I think that's important uh, for those of us that have seen it in practice to, mm. to say, yeah, you know, God's ways are, are good. So this is interesting to me because um, I'm hearing you say that people hear you talk about the blueprint for the Christian life. Mm -hmm. And they actually get converted. So you yes, were telling me about yeah. a lady in Adelaide just last night that came up to you yeah. and said how she'd returned to the faith. Yeah. Um, Philip Jensen here in Sydney did this famous talk called in, in the 90s, a fair while ago, um, called Love, Sex and Marriage and outlining the blueprint for just that. Mm -hmm. And he said it's amazing how many people got converted. Mm -hmm. But he said whenever he preached the gospel evangelistically, it's amazing how many people got married. <laughs> but um, yeah. have, you, have you experienced yeah. a similar thing? Uh, yeah. Are you seeing people through ACL actually come to faith in Jesus? Yes, absolutely, hundred um, percent. This is the thing, you know. Uh, Why? What's 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 happening there? Because I think what ACL is doing is that we're meeting we're meeting the world where it is, and we're pointing people back to faith. I say it's like a reverse sermon. You know, it's not going from Bible to application. It's going from application, which is saying, saying this is the circumstance. This is how the world is. Interesting. How therefore should we think? How therefore should we act? Where is the source of truth on this matter? Hmm. And there's a lot of people out there, particularly, and not exclusively, but particularly people who have some form of Christian influence in their background. So they might have grown up in a Catholic school or they might have some Christian connection yeah. and they've gone through life with a basically kind of Judeo-Christian worldview but with the world changing under, around them and them sitting there going, this is what I believe, why? Why do I believe it? And they in particular are encountering the ministry of ACL in large numbers and going, I think I believe this because God, Scripture, Christ... And they're being drawn back in to the, the ultimate foundational truth. And yes, and it's not just them. There are others as well. There was mm -hmm. one lady that um, one of our supporter relations people talked to who was heavily into New Age. And she started watching the videos. And she said it was like every time I finished a video, it was like a voice said to me, Christ alone, Christ alone, Christ alone. And she realized what, what she'd got wrong. Uh, and she wanted to know where to go to church. She signed up as a volunteer, all sorts of things. So these things are happening all over the place because this is the truth of God and it has an origin and a source. And the origin and the source is, well, God himself and it is ultimately the gospel. That's his outreach to the human race. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, just quickly, um, um, you were, oh, there's so many things I want to ask you. I'm just, I'm just trying to pick them in my head. We can, we can edit it down later. I know, but uh, yeah, tell us what happened last the, last night. You're in Adelaide. You're doing the Walk for Life uh, against abortion. Mm -hmm. um, a lady came up to you. You're just telling me about it before we yeah. we started, and I was just blown away. Oh, look! Uh, what did she say to you? This does happen from time to time. But a lady came up to me after the talk, and she just said, um, she said, look. She said, I've, I've been unwell lately, um, you know, and I've just come down because this, mm. this event was on. Uh, and she said, I just wanted to, you to know that you're the reason I've come back to my faith. Mm. Um, and uh, that was that, you know. Uh, there was a big cue to talk and I sort of said, oh, I sort of engaged in a bit of conversation and then asked who she was and said, you know, I'll pray for you. And that's all she wanted to let me know. Mm. Um, but that sort of thing, whether it's via 
those sorts of interactions or messages through social media or, you know, I had a lady contact me the other day from Norway, of all places. Interestingly, Scandinavian countries, there's a little bit of a, I don't know, we've got a, a bit revival? of an audience up there. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Netherlands, Maybe Norway, they associate, Sweden. so you do um, look sort of Nordic. I kind of look Nordic, don't I? You do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> when People I went, have said I, I look Scandinavian as well, but... Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm joking. That's a joke. <laughs> you look more. See, I've got a Welsh heritage in my family, so uh, yeah, I'm Welsh actually Welsh. Are, are, are shorter and browner, aren't they? So, yeah. <laughs> not that you're short. The Mark sub- isn't short. The southern. The uh, southern. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, so there is a bit of an audience up there, and this lady said, "Look, um, she she had tried to get her, her husband had basically drifted away." Yeah. Uh, and this is a very common sort of person uh, that encounters this stuff. And she uh, started, she's trying to get him onto all sorts of different speakers mm. and it just wasn't working. But she yeah. started watching the truth of it and this kind of stuff. And then Amazing. he started watching. And after a while, he just said to her, he said, you know, I actually, I know it's true. Wow. I know it's true, you know, and I'm coming back. Uh, and she just sent that little testimonial through, which was tremendous. You know, this kind of stuff is happening. And here's the thing. When we are all that we are supposed to be in the world, yeah, talk about Jesus, please do, right? I mm-hmm. say to people, keep doing that. But don't neglect yeah. the full scope of your testimony and your witness in the world and the truth you're to speak and the person you're to be and the family that you're to have and the way that you're to engage in, in the civic spaces. Don't neglect that because when we are all of that, you know, people will glorify God. Yeah, it is fascinating. You are like a Nordic Billy Graham because um, I'm, uh, I'm interviewing... I'm actually Nordic. I, I, I know that. that I, I know that. But um, it's interesting in a few months' time... It should time, be noted that I'm sitting down. So That's right. Yeah. Correct. But... Um, I'll be uh, interviewing, hopefully, Dr. Hugh Chilton, who's done a lot of research on Billy Graham and how political, actually, his crusades were. So that's a topic for another time. Mm -hmm. But one final question, if I can, and I'd love to talk to you some more. I have to do this again, okay? Um, When you look at ACL, it has a big conference every year. Mm. Um, If you could have – I know you're planning this next one, but if if Martin Niles could just have – free reign to do whatever he wanted to do for a conference. What do you think is the most encouraging, edifying, pressing concern that you'd like to address right now? You know the answer to this already. (laughs) Never ask a question. Mark asked me this question earlier. (laughs) Well, if we could have a conference tomorrow and I could have whoever I wanted come along and there was no limits, mm-hmm. I would have a conference in the International Convention Centre in Sydney and I would call it Jesus Saves. And people would say, why as a political lobby? Well, because I think that Christians in this country and across the world need to recover the great truth that we do have the answers. The world does need the answers that God has given us and revealed to us, and those answers are good, and they are the only real answers for the world. And the way I would do that is to say, hey, you know what? We've got conversion therapy. Hey, here is Joe Bloggs, used to be a gay man, now a Christian. He's going to tell you about it. You know, here is, uh, you know, like someone like Beckett Cook from the US or someone. Or here is, you know, Jeremy, used to be a trans woman, now detransitioned, has a testimony to tell Christ saved him, Mm. the truth reached him. Uh, You know, here is, uh, you know, Anne so-and-so used to be a frothing leftist Marxist uh, in the university system, Uh, you know, came across whatever, went through a testimony, became a Christian, political transformation, personal transformation, spiritual transformation. I know all these people. Unfortunately, they're scattered around the world a little bit, Uh, but there are plenty of people who are local. I'd love to get them on the stage to say, here's my story. And to have the whole room go, you know, and hopefully we get 5,000 people along and have the whole room go, you know what, we just got to get out there and give the world the truth because it needs it. I have to ask this bonus question. Okay, I did say the last one was, but <laughs> <Why don't we? laughs> ACL has had a huge role with, I think, one of the most important legal test cases in Australian history, namely Israel Folau. Mm-hmm. What do you think is it – after all the dust has now settled on that case, um, some people would have said you shouldn't have even touched it, mm-hmm. right? He's, he wasn't kosher enough for, uh, for them. Yep. Um, what would you want to say summing up that whole saga, let's call it? Because it was massive. Oh, wow. That was huge. Uh, summing up the whole saga. You know... And you know Israel personally. Yes. It had a lot to do with he and his yes. wife, Maria. Yes. What would you say to people out there, particularly that might be sceptical 
that ACL has, should ever have been involved? Well, I'll answer in two parts. The first part, I just want to say that the reason I ever got involved in the first place was because of uh, effectively, and it's funny, this kind of happened. If you watch the interview we did with Israel at our conference in 2019, yeah. you'll see that this was really a big result for him of some prayers that he prayed. Totally unintentional <laughs> result. Like he didn't. You've got to explain yeah. that. Well, he, he, he prayed to God to say that, you know, he'd like a, a, a test for his faith, a challenge. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. What a stupid. <laughs> I know, what a thing to pray, you know? And, uh, and, and it's this, like playing for patience. He's like, he's like, God prepared this for me, so I have to go through it, you know, sort of thing. Mm. Um, but also, it was interesting because I prayed some prayers as well. Uh, and this came up in result as a result of the prayers that I prayed. Again, never intended it this way, never expected this. But this is how it went. So I got involved because I knew I was supposed to get involved. Mm. I didn't ask questions about is he kosher, etc. I knew that it was the right thing prayerfully to do. Uh, but also I knew that it was defending what? Well, it was a paraphrase of the Bible. and It was a statement of absolute gospel, literally gospel truth. Uh, and, you know, if, if you can't talk about the gospel truth like a footballer, well, you know, you're very close to not being able to talk about it at all. Uh, it had to be defended. Um, so it was crucial. But look... I would say as well, um, you know, one of the things I can't tell the whole story because a lot of it's legally privileged and things like that, but Israel is a man of unthinkable courage, conviction, uh, and he is completely rested in Christ. And that is how he's been able to persevere with everything that happened. And that is why, despite all the machinations that came from Rugby Australia and from various troublemakers around that and all the offers of the world that he could have had if he but recanted. And he stood a bit like Martin Luther and said, I will not recant, I can't recant. I can do anything else, but I can't recant. Uh, and uh, I just have so much respect for the guy. Uh, I think he's a tremendous example to us all of courage and of living first for Christ. He's a little bit like a Daniel figure, really. I mean, mm. there was Daniel. You could argue with Daniel till the cows come home about how unwise he was. I mean, what did he do? Prayer was made illegal. Goes back and not only continues to pray, but continues to do it in the window yeah. three times a day, right? Just carries on as if it doesn't exist. Mm. And you go, oh, come on, man. You're just causing trouble. Oh, gee, mm. you know, you're a, blah, blah, blah. You didn't have to do it that way, etc. Mm. Look. Where people are at with the Lord and what they're led to do in those things, I think, is sometimes not a question for us. Mm. And I think that the way Israel was expressing his faith online was admirable and it came to bite him and he did right, mm. come what may, through the whole thing. He reminds me of Eric Liddell. Mm. Um, he, he wouldn't run on the Sabbath. Yeah. Um, he followed through with his convictions and the Lord mm. honours those who honour him. It's absolutely right. It is absolutely right. And I go, well, where's Raylene Castle today? Yeah. Where's Qantas today? Whereas, you know, it's interesting to me, and I don't say this to gloat or anything like that, but it is just interesting to me that those who sought to um, bring Izzy down, oh, uh, there's been a bit of a... They, they've all suffered for that, um, and that's in God's hands, uh, and I'm not gloating, but it is interesting to me. Meanwhile, Israel actually is doing very well, uh, mm -hmm. And I think that God probably has honoured his testimony and his witness. Um, and uh, and just to hear him say in that interview, let alone in other contexts, but in that interview that's available online, uh, for him to say, you know, you say, would you do it again? He says, in a heartbeat. Because mm -hmm. he says, the peace that is in your heart from Christ, mm -hmm. nothing is better than that. Yeah, it's incredible. When you go to bed at night, head on the pillow, you're at peace. Uh, and I think that's an incredible testimony. Uh, and mm -hmm. it should it should embolden us all to believe what Jesus said, which is blessed are the persecuted for righteousness sake. You know, to tell us that actually you shrink back, don't you, because you're afraid of the consequences. Mm -hmm. But we need to believe that there's a blessing. Uh, and I think people like Israel are the proof of that. Yeah, and can I just say, look, thank you so much. I, one of the verses that always comes to mind when I think of you and, and I see you in the public square and I hear you criticised, especially by fellow Christians, I think of Jesus' words in Luke's Gospel where he says, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. That is <laughs> yes. how they treated the false prophets. I got that verse right at the start of this gig. Mm. <laughs> I, I read it and I thought, isn't that interesting? You know? yeah. So that's you, brother. Yeah. So hopefully everyone doesn't speak well of me. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But you know what? Yeah. We, um, there are many that do and we are very thankful to God for what you're doing. We pray that God continues to bless you and protect you and lead you. Thank you so much for your time today and um, we pray and hope every blessing upon you and the ministry of ACL. Thank you for what you're doing. 
Thank you, Mark. And I really appreciate it. And thank you for your support, friendship and everything. All right. Well, this has been Mark Powell with Martin Niles, the Managing Director of Australian Christian Lobby. You can see him on Facebook, social media, Twitter, Instagram. He's everywhere. Um, and uh, de- definitely at their ACL conference later in the year. But um, I've been Mark Powell for Australian Presbyterians Profiles in Christian Living and I hope to see you next time.